John Santiago, the state secretary of veteran services, our guest this morning. Let's go on the record. Former state representative, now a member of the governor's cabinet with his background as a soldier, as a doctor, his new mission to be there for our vets. Let's go on the record. From WCVB Channel 5, the inside word from Washington to Beacon Hill. Today's newsmakers are going on the record. Welcome to OTR, everyone. I'm Ed Harding, along with, as you can see, John Santiago. Charmin Sacchetti is off this Sunday. And joining me at the table is John Santiago. He is the Commonwealth Secretary of Veterans Services. He stepped down as the state representative to take that position. We're going to go through the, the bio. We've, we've shown the bio before, but especially when you were running for mayor. But we're going to show it again. You're, you're, a, you're a doctor. And a captain in the Army Reserve? That's right. I'm a major now. I got You're promoted. a major? Yes. Wonderful. Major in the, in the Army Reserve. Peace Corps volunteer still? That's right. How do you have time for anything? He holds degrees from the University of Texas, the University of Washington, and Yale. And your son is how old? He's 15 months. 15 months yeah. old. Raphael. Raphael. Yeah. Well, that's yeah. wonderful. Well, congratulations Thank on you. Raphael. It's great to have you back it's in the chair. It's good to be back here. So uh, let, let's, let's talk about where you are right now. Governor Healy made your your position, a cabinet level position for the first time. It is clearly a priority for the governor. I, I assume you feel the same way. And it also follows that tragic failure at the Holyoke Soldiers Home during the pandemic. Some almost 80 veterans dying of COVID-19. A new soldier's home will be built in Holyoke. Can you assure that the management of the past is past? Well, let me just be very clear. COVID is with us. It will always be here. Mm -hmm. But we've changed a lot in terms of how we go approach COVID. And I know COVID quite well as a physician as an emergency room provider who worked in the depths of COVID throughout every, each surge, those lessons were hard fought and we learned them. And over the course of these past three years, things have changed. We have vaccines, we have medications, we have a whole host of evidence-based practices to, to address them. And so with respect to the homes, a lot of things are changing. You know, mm -hmm. part of the Light, bill- for example. Well, are, a part of the bill that created in my office, chapter right. 144, right. Put, put forward a whole host of efforts to standardize, professionalize efforts at both homes. Right. So right now, both homes have to be run by a nursing home administrator. Uh -huh. You know, we are looking to get DPH licensed, certified by the Center of Medicaid and Medicare Services. We're, we're, it's almost surprising it's not there already. I would agree. And so my charge is really to put forth these efforts. And it's somewhat of a startup. I mean, we're creating this whole new agency. It was a department for a very long time within the behemoth that is Health and Human Services, right? right? right. Half the budget. But now it's taken out, it's been elevated to the cabinet level. So it's somewhat of a startup, but as you say, it's somewhat of a turnaround as well. Mm -hmm. We have to fix the homes and we're committed to doing that. It, you know, it, it, the, the, it, it, the, the, there's a Chelsea Soldiers home that's also struggling with, with COVID as well. It struggled, it, it had a COVID outbreak obviously at the beginning and then just recently had another, had another COVID outbreak. So what is the status now of the Chelsea home? So, so that's correct. You know, a couple of weeks ago, there was a cluster of cases there. There were about 16 residents and about 15 staff. But again, we're in a different place where we were in March, 2020. Mm -hmm. Those residents were vaccinated. They got antivirals. We, we used evidence-based uh, measures. Mm -hmm. We empowered staff and we took care of it. And now there are no COVID positive cases there. Wait. One person went to the hospital and stayed overnight and that was it. And is, is it, is it, informational is it informative that that even after the the protections and procedures put in place for COVID, it still managed to to go through the building it's still well, it's, managed it's just to, be or is that a byproduct of the of the, of the system well COVID 19 is endemic it's just like the flu is right we will right. always we have to live season, with it we will we live with it we will manage it appropriately and as a new secretary we're committed to working with staff stakeholders residents to make sure that we are providing quality care Speaking of Chelsea, we know the plans are set to add a 154-bed long-term community care facility to Chelsea. Talk about the, the housing component to help veterans. Well, that might be the most exciting part of this. You're absolutely right. A part of my charge is to rebuild the two homes. And quite literally, the Chelsea home, the CLC, the Community Living Center, that will be opening up hopefully later this year. It's a brand new home, fantastic. I mean, as a medical professional, I can tell you that that is the most magnificent healthcare building I've ever seen. It's also 100% fossil free. Mm -hmm. With respect to Holyoke, about a month and a half ago, we secured the federal funding to build, rebuild a brand new Holyoke uh, veterans home. So we're committed to doing that. But in addition to the CLC in Chelsea, there are about nine buildings, a domiciliary component in Chelsea, which we're yeah. going to convert to federal, excuse right. me, to veteran housing right. over the course of the next couple of years. How, how and, and, and forgive the simple nature of the question, but, but how can that affect a veteran's life? How will that affect a veteran's stay in the facility? 
Well, so in the facility? Yeah, well, or, or well, in, in life. I'll well, stick it life. It's, I mean, it's just going to allow folks to isolate in case they get a, you know, impacted with COVID-19. Just the facilities, I mean, I, I really would invite you to come to Chelsea, check it out. It's on top of a hill. It's just a magnificent building. It's going to allow the, phys the physicians, the nursing staff, the CNAs to do their job mm -hmm. and to provide the utmost respect and care for these veterans who really, you know, given their life to this country. And, uh, for us, right. For us, for absolutely. Us, right. And, and by the way, you are, uh, you serve. And so thank you for that. Uh, so we know we know that substance abuse and mental health issues are major factors when when dealing with the challenges that that veterans face. Many of those struggling find themselves, for example, in the area of Mass and Cass in Boston. And, and many conversations lead to this spot here. You represented that area, right? When you were in the state house? That's right. I represented the area. I also lived down the street. And, and you I treated when you, when you when you were a doctor in the ER. You treated overdose victims. Yeah, I, I treated folks who were impacted by violence, uh, impacted by overdose. I mean, a, a number of things at Mass and Cass. So I'm still quite connected to the situation there. And, and you're right. Whether it's the trifecta of mental health issues, substance use, and homelessness, they Im impact a lot of people all over the Commonwealth. I mean, we're living in a mental health crisis, mm -hmm. and veterans are sometimes disproportionately impacted by these things, whether mm -hmm. it's PTSD, right, anxiety, right, depression. Right. And so in our office, we're looking to amplify our efforts yeah. with respect to that. Well, well uh, given your unique set of, of, of experiences and skills and, and, and life experiences, how can you help uh, deliver better mental health services? Well, I come with a variety of uh, background that really addresses this stuff, right? I mean, I see, what, what I'm interested about is that when someone has a mental health issue, it's connected to a variety of issues, right? Mm -hmm. Whether it's housing, access to economic uh, uh, employment or education. And so we're looking at providing veterans all across the Commonwealth with a variety of services and resources that we can best engage them. And I can tell you that we have been out there on the front lines engaging with veterans all across the Commonwealth. In our first 100 days, we have visited all 14 counties from Pittsfield to Nantucket. We have engaged so many service providers across it because it's important that we what are you establish hearing? and engagement. And what are you hearing when you, when, you, when you walk in the street, when you talk to that people? That we need your support, we want you to leave, we want you to be there. We know that you're starting up this new agency yeah. and that you're turning it around, yeah. but we want to be engaged in the process and we're committed to making sure that they have a voice. It, 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 it is, is reality that you can't, you can't correct the situation 100% because it just can't happen? Well, I mean, do you, so do you try to achieve, I don't know, 50, 70, 80, 90? I know you try to achieve yeah, 100. Yeah. I understand well, that. Well, you, you can't change the past, but you can shape the future. And we look forward to doing that with Governor Healy's leadership, Kim Driscoll as lieutenant governor. They're committed to this. They care very much about this. They are personally connected to the military as well through their family. Right. And so it's a priority for the administration, and it's my charge to lead that effort, and we're looking forward to it. So late last year, you were, you were in Syria. Right. Uh, yeah, just got back in February on an on, on an Army Reserve assignment. When when you first talked to Governor Elect Healy about your, uh, she was then Governor Elect Healy at the That's time, correct. right? What did she do? Call you in Syria? Say, well, just, I, I'm I, just curious I, about well, the logistics. I, I, yeah, I had a couple conversations with a variety of people yeah. uh, while I was while I was in Syria. Um, fortunately, I got back health and healthy and safely. Yep. And but I've been deployed twice. Uh, you know, being in the military, is something I care very much about. Uh, my family uh, was served as well. Um, but when I got back, I got back in February, we, I was appointed uh, March 1st, and for the past 90 plus days or so, we've been out there working. So, so as, as you so humbly mentioned, and, and uh, uh, you've seen in real time what our soldiers are facing, and, and until you see it, it, we can read about it, I can read about it, I can see it on TV, I can show it on TV, but I can't appreciate it because I haven't been there. You've been there. How does that impact what you're doing now? Well, I think what the Army teaches you, um, it's about being a leader. Right? It's about engaging folks and making sure that they're part of the solution. And when veterans come back from abroad or from wherever, they're facing a whole host of issues, mm -hmm. whether it's reintegrating back into society, mental health issues, you name it. And we want to be there to support them. We want to be able to say, listen, there are opportunities in education and employment and mental health. And we want to be able to allow uh, you know, for a system that can get you the services that you need. You're an important part of this country. You've dedicated your life to service, and we want to be there for you. Hence, it's it's now a cabinet position here in the Congress. That's right, and we want to honorably serve those who've served us. I mean, that really is the mission of, of our executive office.